if S1 and S2 are non-empty subsets of the real numbers that are bounded from above, prove that the least upper bound of the set x plus y such that x is an element of S1 and y is an element of S2 is equal to the least upper bound of S1 plus the least upper bound of S2. Okay, so we're going to prove this in two separate parts here. In the first part, we want to be able to talk about the least upper bound of this set, which I'll call W, so let W, just for shorthand, let W equal the set X plus Y, such that X is in S1, and Y is in S2. So we want to be able to talk about this least upper bound, and in order to be able to talk about it, it has to exist. So we have to first prove that it's non-empty and bounded from above. So it's obviously not empty because S1 and S2 are not empty. So therefore there must at least be at least one element in W since there is it, there's at least one X in S1 and at least one Y in S2. So thus we know for sure that W is not empty, but now we need to prove that it's bounded from above. And that's, that's a short little proof, but um, we'll do that in part one. So prove, prove W is bounded from above. And in the second part, in the second part, we're going to prove what they asked us to prove. So prove, prove what they asked. Prove what they asked. Since we're now in part two able to talk about the least upper bound of, we have permission, we have permission to talk about the least upper bound of W. Okay, so for part one, for part one, I'm going to ask us to remember to, or remember slash know, remind ourselves, or if you don't already know, that's okay, we'll, we'll just, um, I'll just tell you um, these two results, which I've proven in separate videos that I've linked in the description, and I've also linked in this eye icon in the top right corner. So remember slash no, these two results. So the first result is if A is less than B and C is less than or equal to D, then this implies that A plus C is strictly less than, is strictly less than B plus D. And simil similarly, in two, actually I haven't proven this, but it's an easy extension of one. It's a, it's a quick, easy extension of the proof for one. If A is less than or equal to B and C is less than or equal to D, then this implies that A plus C is less than or equal to B plus D. And I encourage you to watch this video of the proof of one and um, try to extend it to the pro to prove two here. Um, but I promise it's, it's an easy extension of that proof for one. So, he okay, so we're now primed to prove that W is bounded from above. So, we know that since, oh, by the way, for shorthand, so I don't have to write least upper bound of S1 and least upper bound of S2, I'm going to say let U equal least upper bound of S1 and V is equal to the least upper bound of S2. So we know that since U is the least upper bound of S1, then for all X in S1, X is less than or equal to U. Again, for all x in S1. And so, in, the, in the same way, y is less than or equal to v for all y in S2, since v is the least upper bound of S2. So, since these two hold for all x in S1 and y in S2, these two inequalities hold, by 2, by this second property here, the second result, x plus y is less than or equal to u plus v. Again, since these two inequalities hold for all x in S1 and y in S2, then it follows that this inequality holds for all, again, by this second result here, and for all x in S1 and y in S2. And remember, each element of w, each element of w is a, the sum of an element from S1 and an element from S2. So thus, all elements of W are X plus Y for all X and S1 and Y and S2. So thus, this inequality holds for all elements in W. And by definition of an upper bound, that means that X plus Y, all X plus Y, and therefore all elements in W, 
Again, all x plus y is such as x is an s1 and y is an s2. So therefore, all elements of w is less than, are, are less than u plus v. Therefore, y, w is bounded from above. And moreover, since we talked about how w is non-empty, since s1 and s2 are non-empty, therefore, w has a least upper bound by the least upper bound property of the real numbers. So, and moreover, we can say that u plus v is an upper bound of w, and that'll be that'll be helpful for us later. Okay, so we've proven we've proven one, we've proven one here, and I'm going to clear the board to give us room to prove two here. So to prove two, again, I'm going to remind us of what we called everything. So let w equal the set x plus y such that x is an s1 and y is an s2. And then u is equal to the least upper bound of s1, and v is equal to the least upper bound of s2. Okay, so to prove, let's prove this result here. So, we know that u plus v is an upper bound, is an upper bound of w. So that's nice, that's nice. So to prove... This, if u plus v is the least upper bound, if we were able to prove that u plus v is the least upper bound of w, then we've proven our result, because u plus v is the least upper bound of s1 plus the least upper bound of s2. So suppose, we're going to prove this by contradiction. So suppose, for the purposes of contradiction, suppose u plus v is not the least upper bound least upper bound. So if u plus v is not the least upper bound, that implies that there's an upper bound that's smaller than u plus v. So this implies, writing this in, in mathematical terms, this implies that there exists, there exists, I'll call it a c and r in the real numbers, such that c is strictly less than u plus v, and c is an upper bound of w, so therefore c is greater than or equal to x plus y for all x and s1 and y and s2. And our goal here, our goal here is to prove that this statement, this, st this statement star, is a contradiction. Our goal here is to prove that that's a contradiction. And if you can prove this a contradiction, then there can't possibly be a, an upper bound that's smaller than u plus v Therefore, u plus v must be the least upper bound. Okay, so before we prove, or excuse me, dis, or prove that star is a contradiction, we're going to use two auxiliary results, aka lemmas, to help us along here. So, lemma one. Lemma one. If, if d is the least upper bound of a set S is the least upper bound of S and X is in R such that X is less than that least upper bound D, then this implies that there exists an element in S, I'll call it an S in S, such that that S is strictly greater than that X that we said is less than, strictly less than, that least upper bound d. Okay, so that pretty much says that given any element strictly less than the least upper bound of a set s, I'm always going to be able to find an element in that set s that's strictly greater than that, that r that's strictly less than the least upper bound. So I'm always going to be able to find an element in s that's greater, that's strictly greater than any element in R that is strictly less than the least upper bound of a set S. Okay, so proof. We're going to prove this by contradiction. Proof. So suppose, suppose that this statement, statement is false, is false. So if we were to suppose the statement is false, that this implies that there exists an X less than D but there does not exist, there does not exist an S and S such that X, excuse me, S is strictly greater than X. 
So if there does not exist an S and S such that X is strictly uh, X is strictly less than S, remember there's only three possibilities for the relationship between X and S. X can be equal to S, X can be strictly less than S, or X can be strictly greater than S. So we just said that there does, that does not exist an S and S. So every element S, no matter what element we choose, we can't, if we were to suppose that the statement is false, we can't find an S that is strictly greater than X. Therefore, the only other two possibilities for every S and S are these two. X is either equal to S or X is either greater than S for all S. So this implies, this implies for all S and S, S is less than or equal to, remember S is either less than X or S is equal to X. So S is less than or equal to X. But look at this. This implies, this implies by definition of an upper bound, this implies that X is an upper bound, is an upper bound of S. But we said, but we said that X is less than D and D is the least upper bound, is the least upper bound of S. So we found an upper bound, we found an upper bound of S that is strictly less than the least upper bound of S. This is impossible. This is a contradiction. This is a contradiction. Therefore, we've proven that if we were to suppose that this statement is false, we arrive at a contradiction. So it must be true. It must be true. So we've proven lemma one. We've proven lemma one. And we're going to use this lemma to prove lemma two, which is going to help be the, our biggest help in proving our main statement. So lemma two states the following. Given, given any epsilon, any epsilon strictly greater than zero, where D, where D is the least upper bound of a set S, there exists an S in S such that D minus epsilon is strictly less than S. So it's a very similar statement. Given any epsilon, D minus that epsilon, if I, if I consider the number D minus that epsilon, I'll always be able to find an S, an element in the set of which D is the least upper bound of. I'll always be able to find an element S in that set that is strictly greater than D minus epsilon. Okay, so again, suppose, so for the proof, proof, suppose that this is false. So this implies, this implies, if I were to suppose that this is false, again, this implies that, well actually, we're not gonna, we don't even need to suppose that this is false, excuse me. We don't even need to suppose this is false. We can prove this using lemma, lemma one here. So proof, let me re rewrite this proof. Proof, d minus epsilon is equal to some element r in the real numbers, such that, such that R is strictly less than D. R is an element in the real numbers that is strictly less than D, where D is the least upper bound of S. And if we scroll back up to our lemma one, if D is the least upper bound and X is an R such that X is strictly less than D, then there must exist an element in S such that S is strictly greater than that element that I said was strictly less than the least upper bound of S. And this is the same situation. There's an R, there's an R in the real numbers that is less than, strictly less than the least upper bound of S. So therefore, by lemma one, by lemma one, there exists, there must exist an S, an S such that S is strictly greater than R, which implies that S is strictly greater than D minus epsilon and we've proven lemma two. Okay, so we're primed, we're primed to prove our statement here. We're primed to prove, or excuse me, to prove that this star, statement star, is a contradiction. We are ready. So let me clear the board finally to prove statement, this, to prove that this statement star is a contradiction. So, remember, if we were to suppose that this statement is false, then this implies, if we were to suppose that the least upper bound of W is not equal to U plus V, remember U is equal to the least upper bound 
of S1, and V is equal to the least upper bound of S2. If you were to suppose that that's false, then that point means that there exists a, a C in the real numbers such that C is strictly less than U plus V, and C is also, there exists an upper bound that is smaller than U plus V, and since C is an upper bound, that means that it's greater than or equal to all elements in W. Remember, W is equal to the set X plus Y, such that X is in S1, and Y is in S2. So, now, we know that U is the least upper bound of S1. So, given any epsilon greater than zero, there exists an A in S1 such that, remember this is by lemma two, by lemma two, given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists an A in S1 such that U minus epsilon is strictly less excuse me, u minus epsilon over 2 is strictly less than a. And you might be wondering, well, how can you say epsilon over 2? Well, I can say given any number, any number here. Epsilon could be anything. It could be epsilon. It could be epsilon over 2. It could be, it could be 1. It could be a million given any epsilon. So therefore, we could put epsilon over 2. We could put epsilon over a million. Given any number that's strictly greater than 0, there exists an a in S1 such that u minus epsilon over 2 is strictly less than a. And similarly, similarly, <laughs> given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists a B in S1, excuse me, B in S2, sorry, such that V minus epsilon over two is strictly less than B because V is the least upper bound of S2 and by by lemma two, we were able to say the statement. We were able to say the statement. We were allowed to. We have permission to say, say these two statements. So therefore, remember the property. Remember way back when um, um, it was the first property of in, the, in red that, that was prefaced with, remember, if A is strictly less than B and C is strictly less than D or equal to D, any C that's strictly less than D or any C that's equal to D, then this implies that A plus C is strictly less than B plus D. So we have, we have a similar statement here. U minus epsilon over 2 is strictly less than A, and V minus epsilon over 2 is strictly less than B. So this implies, by this statement over here, any, remember this applies for any C that's strictly less than D or any C that's equal to D, this implies that U minus epsilon over 2 plus V minus epsilon over 2 is strictly less than A plus B. Simplifying this, we have u plus v minus epsilon is strictly less than a plus b. But look at this. Look at this. T these two properties together, so, so given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, we're always able to find an a in S1 such so that u is u minus epsilon over 2 is strictly less than a. And we're always going to be able to find an epsilon over 2 such, and we're always going to be able to find a b in S2, excuse me, given any epsilon such that V minus epsilon over two is three less than B. So given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, we're always gonna be able to find an A in S1 and a B in S2. Since these two things together imply this, we're always gonna be able to find an A in S1 and a B in S2 such that U plus V minus that epsilon is strictly less than A plus B. And you might be wondering, so how is this gonna help us? How is this gonna help us? But look at this, look at this. We suppose that C, remember, we were, we, were suppo we were supposing that this statement right here, this statement that we're trying to prove is true, we were supposing that it's false, and if it's false, then that means there must be an upper bound of S1, uh, of W so that is strictly less than U plus V. And if this C is strictly less than U plus V, then that, that implies that there exists an epsilon strictly greater than zero, such that U plus V minus epsilon is equal to c. There must exist some some number such that u plus v minus epsilon is equal to c, since c is strictly less than u plus v. So, so we can say the following. Remember, given any epsilon, given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists an a and s1 and a b and s2 such that u plus v minus epsilon is strictly less than a plus b. So we can say by by our previous work 
by our previous work, we can say that there exists, there exists an A in S1 and a B in S2, a B in S2, such that U plus V minus epsilon, which is equal to C, or I'll, I'll say it, I'll say it in the reverse row, C, which is equal to U plus V minus epsilon, since given any epsilon, these two properties hold true, and since these two properties together imply this property, that means that any epsilon, th that, that means that given any epsilon greater than zero, this property holds true. We're always going to be able to find an A in S1 and a B in S2 such that this property holds true. So that implies that we're going to, there exists an A in S1 and a B in S2 such that C, which is equal to U plus V minus epsilon, remember given any epsilon, this property holds true, and we're always going to be finding an A in S1 and a B in S2 such that, such that we can say that A plus B is going to be strictly greater than U plus V minus epsilon. So what, look at what this means. We were supposing that C is an upper bound, C is an upper bound of W. But look at this, I just found an element of W, because A is in S1 and B is in S2, that is strictly greater than C. I just found an element of W that is strictly greater than C, but we thought that C was the up. we were saying that C is the upper bound. If we were to suppose that that statement is false, this statement is false up here, if we were to suppose that this statement, this statement is not false, by the way, I'm saying if we were to suppose that this statement is false, then there must exist an upper bound strictly less than U plus V. But given any upper bound that's strictly less than U plus V, you, that upper bound is going to be equal to U plus V minus some epsilon, and by our previous work up here, that eps, given any epsilon, U plus V minus epsilon, we're always going to be, be able to find an A in S1 and a B in S2, such that A plus B is strictly greater than U plus V minus epsilon, which is equal to that C, which we were saying, which we were supposing exists and must be an upper bound. So this is a contradiction. This is a contradiction. This is a contradiction because C is an upper bound, and we just found an element in W that is greater than the upper bound. Thus, there cannot exist a C that is strictly less than U plus V. Because if we were to suppose that that's true, then we're always going to be able to find an element in W, an element in W, A plus B is in W, such that that element in W is strictly greater than that upper bound. So this is a contradiction. Therefore, therefore, and there can't be an element that's strictly greater than an upper bound. Think about that. You can't have an element that's greater than your upper bound. So, there can exist an upper bound that's strictly less than u plus v. Thus, we've proven the statement that if we were to suppose that this is true, if we were supposed, excuse me, if, if we were supposed to, if we were to suppose that the least upper bound of w is not equal to the least upper bound of s1 plus least upper bound of s2, then we would arrive at a contradiction.